So good afternoon, every everyone. I hope that you've all had a uh, a great morning in listening to the conference and the speakers we've had. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you all um, an educator, Claudia Fox Tree, um, who is on the ground at middle school level. She teaches courses and workshops on transforming the curriculum and particularly in culturally responsive teaching practices. Claudia has been a middle school special education teacher for over 30 years in Massachusetts public school system. She's taught professional development on social justice courses at the college level for more than 25 years. Please welcome Claudia. Tagwe Vituno, Kena Atiano, Yurman Arawak, Dakadiri, Claudia Foxtry, Dakadiri, Takinaru, Dakadiri, Yuka, Yukei, Guainia, Undach Deutsch, Mutalish Seitz, Koa Idaka Iaha. Greetings, my name is Claudia Foxtry, and I introduced myself in the language of my ancestors. First Taino for the, my father, and then German for my mother. German's my first language, though I have limited vocabulary now. Um, I have Arawak indigenous ancestry. We're the people from the Caribbean. I also introduced my tribal community, Guainia, and my indigenous name, Takinaru, which translates to woman who leads or teaches. I use she, her, hers, and I live on the traditional unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Pawtucket and Penacock, now known as Bill Ricca. Because I live on another tribal nation's land, I wanted to express gratitude to them. Uh, it's important to, for us all to acknowledge the land that we're on because one of the problems in education with groups of color in general and specifically with its indigenous Native American people is making them invisible in multiple ways. We make them invisible by not naming that this was the, their land. We make indigenous people invisible in our curriculum. We make students feel invisible by not including pieces of their culture and stories. And so indigenous people are a good place to start. And we're gonna spend some time today looking at what it means for other groups as well. So I'm gonna share a presentation and I'll tell you now, I've already added a couple of slides that weren't on the original um, document because I just decided I wanted to add that as I looked at it over time. So apologies for that. Not, a, not many, just two, I think, that were new. Um, I wanted to show you a map, again, thinking of the tribal land acknowledgement. And you can see here how uh, this, the large map shows the traditional territories of all the indigenous people of the Massachusetts area and how those names have been erased and replaced with settler colonial names. I grew up uh, near Shawmet and went to school, and got educated at colleges in Shawmet, and you might know that as Boston. And so if we know the original names, it's nice to be able to pull them up and say it. And when I talk about indigenous people, which will be some of my examples, I'm talking about all of the people from North and South America or the indigenous people of the Western hemisphere before 1492, when it was named with other people's names. Because of course, indigenous people are anybody around the world who is indigenous to land. These are the people that I would be talking about. And we're gonna do implicit, talk about implicit bias and, special, and children with special needs. And before I do that, I need to do one more acknowledgement and gratitude, which is that everything that I'm talking about is my sphere of influence. It's what I grew up with. It's what I know best. It's um, what I received education in. And I have a college degree. My parents have college degrees. I can go to my kitchen sink or the sink at school and I can get water to drink. And there are people all around the world and in Navajo Nation here in the United States that don't even have access to clean drinking water. And so in terms of um, my own privilege, I like to keep in mind that I come with my own perspective and my own experiences. And it's not the same as every indigenous person. It's not the same as every special educator. And I have certain advantages that other groups don't have. For example, um, being documented, you know, being a US citizen and um, speaking English fluently. These are all 
advantages that may give me certain kinds of access and also help me help folks who don't have that access. And so I can do translations or make sure that we're doing things that have multiple languages because I have access to people who are speaking English. So there's ways that having that privilege is important to acknowledge and to realize that we can use it to create equity for others. Uh, in general, what I'm gonna do today is not um, exactly linear because I'll be making connections all along, but I wanted to address why we do tribal land acknowledgements. How is history of testing for special needs related to the history of racism in this country. So some of this will be a review and I'm hoping that I can make some links that might've been invisible or that you didn't um, think about before. Um, what's the connection between stereotypes, implicit bias and our practices in school? Uh, how, how can we address the biases? What are intervention strategies? How can we look at contributions um, at cultural wealth, things that kids bring to the classroom? And how is brain research, co-teaching and grouping related to oh, typo, culturally responsive teaching. So this is one of those new slides and already have a typo in it. <laughs> um, so to start us off, here are some examples of stereotypes. These are stereotypes of multiple different groups. They're all around us. We can't help that we're exposed to these. Some um, are in historical things, some are in contemporary. TV shows, movies, cards, Google searches, uh, all stereotypes are damaging. They, they are damaging to the people who they are stereotyping and they're damaging to the groups that they're not stereotyping because it's teaching those groups what to expect or what, uh, what the general population thinks that group looks like. Uh, there's been some research, which I put at the bottom, for example, there's a study that found that whites think black people feel less pain. That continues to this day and it results in um, less pain medicine in the hospital, for example. Uh, there's another study that came out a, a few years ago. 62% of US non-Native Americans report not knowing a single one of the over 5 million Native people in the US. 70% live in urban areas and that of that, we can also think as 78% are off the reservation per the last census. So stereotypes are damaging because they make one story the only story. They affect all children. They don't focus on the strengths, contributions, role models, and resistance, and they have real life long lasting consequences. I like to use um, David Wellman's definition of racism. Racism is a system of advantage based on race. And by system, I mean that it functions at a personal, social, cultural, and institutional level. So it's focusing on all those pieces as a system. It isn't just one person being mean or one person being not nice. It's sometimes characterized that. Um, and Resma Menachem, who wrote My Grandmother's Hand says racism is like the shark. It, people think racism is like the shark. People think it's the KKK or that one evil person. But in fact, racism is the water. Racism is what's all around us that we can't help absorbing. And then we have to spend the rest of our time undoing what we've absorbed, learning what's a stereotype, which is a basis for some of the racist attitudes and decisions and unlearning them and replacing them with accurate information. So there's a strong um, piece of understanding special education law and systems and how they have are related to systemic oppression. So a systemic advantage based on race. So if you advantage one group, you're disadvantaging another group. Cultural racism specifically is when the messages and stories that um, convey ideas that behaviors and values associated with one group, the white group are automatically better. So questions we're gonna look at is where does it show up and what does it maintain? Um, I wanted to review a little bit about the um, eugenics movement because it has direct implications to our special education practices. Francis Galton advanced the idea of eugenics. The term EU means good and genics means stock. <laughs> 
So eugenics is about good stock. He guided conversations throughout the world in the late 1800s and 1900s. And it's important to think of those dates because in the late 1800s, we had the Emancipation Proclamation. So black people were free from slavery for the first time in 400 years. And in the early 1900s, during this time period, westward expansion is also happening. So indigenous people are being killed, their food sources are being destroyed, and the land is being taken. So when this is happening, part of it is to um, justify what's just happened to BIPOC, Black and Indigenous people of color. The intelligence tests that later get developed by Stanford like the Stanford Bernay are used to carry out policies and laws. For example, they label black people as uneducable. They place black children in special classes and schools. They assign black children to lower educational tracks than whites. And they deny, deny black children higher educational opportunities. And that destroys your own feelings about your intellectual potential. Herbert Spencer, uh, applied the ideas of eugenics to survival of the fittest. So the most fit is the one that's going to survive. This is um, applied to the animal kingdom and the natural environment. And he's applying it in a um, cultural way, which doesn't really work because one group has the power to control the culture around us. And eugenicists called for segregated societies with birth control, restrictive marriages, sterilization. Um, and these were Im implemented with the idea that it would reduce the transmission of criminality, idiocy, and imbecility found among these lesser stocks of people. So for indigenous people, there were legal proceedings, for example, that uneducated, helpless, and dependent people needing protection against selfishness of others and their own improvidence. So basically in the law, you then start to have things that say that certain groups can't educate themselves. These are the reasons why, and we need to do it for them. In Canada, Indians were wards of the government and were to be treated as minors without full privileges or citizenships. This is relevant because for indigenous people, there were over 400 boarding schools in the United States and they lasted till 1978, where children were taken from their families and their culture and their community and their language and moved thousands of miles away where there was an a industrial complex that made them follow a religion that they weren't used to, speak a language that wasn't their cultural language and often resulted in death and other horrible things. Uh, the United States was really bad at it, but Canada's boarding schools lasted until 1996. So um, Canada does a lot of things is ahead of its time and in other ways is still trying to make amends for what it did to indigenous people. And of course, this is going to affect how you access school without your own community and family. Um, so Claudia, I know you're very open to questions and we do have a hand up. Um, would you be willing to take that now or would you prefer questions at the end? Uh, I don't mind taking questions now, but it will mean we get through less things later if I take everybody's questions, but I'm okay yeah. with doing that. So do you want okay, to ask so let's, um Yeah, I think let's save the questions to the end then. Jackie, I see your hand. Um, and so, does, so if you want to write it in the um, box or send you a private message? Sure, yeah, you can pop your question, Jackie, in the text box. And if it's something technical, then feel free to send a message to Sarah. Okay, so we'll carry on then. Okay, so again, these intelligence tests are then used to place students into special programs, schools and special education programs. Um, and they were used to support the position that white students or, or Europeans were 
not mentally deficient and needed to be in gifted and talented programs, et cetera. And these tests are often based on cultural things that have to do more with one group than with other groups. So if you don't know what something means, it might be because it's not something that's active in your culture, but it is active in one of the white cultures, the European cultures of knowing it. So Terman, Lewis Terman was the first person who developed the um, Stanford test at Stanford University. And started to take the results. So if you didn't do as well as the, the test, it wasn't considered that it was you didn't have cultural exposure. It was considered that you were depressed as opposed to society was racist. So certain kinds of mental health decisions start to get associated with certain groups who aren't passing these tests. And it isn't seen as a limited access to education because you've been tracked in other programs and it isn't seen as um, not having access to cultural pieces. So maybe it's language or something else in that, that area that's a cultural piece and they are then used to defend school segregation around, along the racial lines. Those kids can't learn as well as other kids. So these tests that we still give them in special ed become how kids of color have been segregated even in our own school systems. So as long as the tests continue to show that certain racial groups weren't doing as well, instead of looking at it and saying that test isn't measuring what we want it to be measuring, it's looked at, this is a really good measure that shows who's not as smart and who's smart. So it gets used to over and over then to reify a system that tracks certain kids as slow learners or dumb learners and restricts access to regular education programs, putting them in special ed or other kinds of courses. And then in addition, kids of color are overrepresented in certain categories of special education, like intellectual disabilities and emotional disturbance. So the ways that tests have been used is as using an inferiority pathology model, which is one of the things I just mentioned, or as cultural deprivation model. And that is blaming the, the kids who don't do as well, that it's their culture and practices that lower the test scores. Not that they haven't accessed all the cultural things they needed to pass the tests. But another model we can look at is a culturally different model that doesn't view cultural differences between whites and minorities as pathology, but instead views it as other gifts and challenges or, or contributions that they can bring. That in terms of challenges, it could be they've been challenged by racism and they've effectively continued to be in school and learn even with that system all around them. So overcoming those challenges would be part of a, looking at how the culturally different model works. Culture load is the extent to which cultural content is embedded in a test instrument. So current tests have a lot of by intelligent tests have biases associated with the culture and the values and performances are not so much a reflection of someone's actual intelligence, but rather their knowledge of certain cultural test content. Um, usually that's of the test composer. So they're developed by white American psychologists. And so those are become the normative types of questions. So if there's questions about um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, that's a story that's told in European cultures, but not necessarily the same story told in cultures that have immigrated from other countries or continents even. And th so those are examples how the culture could not be specific to the, what the kids have grown up with, but doesn't mean that they're not intelligent. 
real world implications of biases and stereotypes. Implicit biases are when there's a stereotype and you explicitly say, I don't have that stereotype, but you still react to it. And so it's implicit, you don't realize you're reacting to it. And so it might seem totally reasonable that someone isn't in a certain kind of a class because they, that group typically doesn't do well. And that is an implicit bias instead of looking at an individual kid or even our own bias in that area. And it can result in kids being tracked in lower programs and not being put in gifted programs. Uh, in the real world, it's, we mentioned how, I mentioned already how it can result in not giving proper medical care. It also results in how quickly people are shot in by the police because many police officers will say, I was in fear for my life, I just reacted. That's a bias, that's an implicit bias. They didn't consciously think, how fast am I reacting? Am I really in danger? They automatically reacted. Our brain can only take so much in. And so there is, the, there is this implicit, there's these connections being made and some of them are happening without our conscious awareness. Neuroscience teaches us that we all have implicit bias. It's not about our intention. Our brain is taking over that fight, flight, fear, freeze response. The more associations we have, the ha faster our brain processes. And there's like a million bits of information we're trying to take in, but we actually only can react to like two bits. There's hardly anything that we consciously can react to while our brain is sorting things. And we take in negative stereotypes just as much as we take in positive stereotypes. And if we actually see more negative stereotypes, we take those in more strongly. So for example, states that have Native American mascots are more likely to associate Native Americans with um, being savages and fearful and dangerous than states that don't have Native American mascots. And states that have even have more grotesque mascots or more, more not realistic ones have a higher association of being afraid and not doing things, wanting to do things with Native Americans. And so that is an implicit bias. If you ask people, they don't consciously say they have more bias towards Native Americans, but unconsciously they do. And this um, is a new piece that I added today, the Harvard University implicit bias test. You can test yourself and see in different categories, racially, ethnically, size, lots of different categories, you become part of their research study, um, but you can do it. And it doesn't test, are you biased or this or biased or that? It tests your reaction response. So how quickly do you associate two things together? And if you more quickly associate the negative with a certain group, that shows a b implicit bias. I know I'm talking really fast, but um, I always feel like if I have people and I get to talk about this, I wanna give you as much information as I can. So I tried doing some videos in like the pre-game warm-up for this conference and the videos weren't working on the site. So you have a link to the video and you can look at this at yourself. For bias, there's three processes. There's the priming, the associations and the assumptions. So if I showed you the video, it would have been this basketball team, the white shirts and the black shirts. And I would ask you to count how many balls, how many times the ball bounced for one of the teams. And while it is an interesting video all on its own, um, most people miss some of the things that are happening in the video. So, and so when you watch it, it takes you through that most people miss that a gorilla walks in the middle of the basketball game or of shooting, not shooting hoops, but bouncing the ball while, while you're counting the balls. Because when your brain gets focused at the thing at hand, the bouncing of the balls, it misses everything else going on because consciously you cannot actually pay attention to everything but unconsciously it's still being absorbed. So what's really interesting in this is that um, Jennifer Eberhardt, she wrote Uncovering Hidden Prejudice That Shapes What We See and Think. It's, the, it's called Biased. The book is called Biased and the subtitle is The Uncovering. 
um, she did research with this same kind of a video and she primed people before she showed the video. Some of the uh, people in her study were primed with a list of names, nothing related to the video, just a list of names that sounded white and others were primed with a list of names that sounded black. When she showed this video, the people who were primed with the list of names that were white sounding names no, didn't really notice the gorilla had the same response as if they hadn't been primed, there was no difference. But people who had had the list of names who were black increased how often they saw the gorilla. They, they saw it quicker than people who hadn't been primed with any names or had been primed with the white names. What that shows is that there's so many associations that we're taught, for example, stereotypes of what African-American people look like, that we don't even need to be told that word that there might be a gorilla or something in the background. When we see the names, we see the gorilla more often because our implicit bias is kicking in and we now are aware of that um, happening in the video. And assumptions are also about the stereotypes, what we're taught to associate either explicitly or implicitly. And so explicitly is when people for the Boston Tea Party, uh, the Sons of Liberty dress up as Native Americans because they have a stereotype that Native Americans are are wild and um, crazy and willing to take risks. So they dress up as Native Americans because they have that assumption and association so that they can feel um, more courage to dump that tea. It wasn't like anybody thought those were really indigenous people getting on that um, Boston, doing dumping tea in the Boston Harbor. Uh, they all knew who it was. So it's really a matter of the dressing up. Boy, this time it is, sun really comes in bright, just all of a sudden shifted to one of the windows. Sorry about that. Um, so how do we undo those biases? Those biases exist. So what we need to think about is how are we gonna undo it in our brain? Uh, this is a graphic of the brain that shows this lizard in the brain stem. And that is the basal ganglia, which is known as the lizard brain, where we have those basic instincts of survival, the fight, fight and flee response. So if we know that we're more likely to pull our gun out on a black man, for example, if we're a police officer, then we need to do something to interrupt that bias. If we know that um, we are more likely to be afraid or, or think um, badly about Native Americans, what can we do to interrupt that bias? So the first strategy is to recognize that the bias exists and, that, and then do something about it, like plan for it, expect that that's gonna happen. Teach ourselves to take three breaths, teach ourselves to stop and ask a question. Or in this example, we have an orchestra that was 100%, 98% men, and they realized that they must have a bias to not hiring women. And so when they have their auditions, they now use a carpet or barefoot behind a screen so that the sound of a shoe or the, how a person looks doesn't inform their decision about how the music is played. And when they did it that way, it increased their um, representation of women to 50% in their blind auditions. This is the example of knowing the stereotype and putting in an intervention. Another thing that we can do is form relationships. So actually work with, meet, hang out with people from other groups. Um, and we can, that's the best way. And he, as teachers, we have that ability when we're setting up our groups, when we're doing our placement to make sure that we're integrating all of the kids in our classroom. We can also learn like reading, watching, listening to multiple different groups and finding out about their histories and cultures and growing that connection and appreciation. And we when we have the relationships and when we see people we care about, we're priming our limbic system with new associations, not the original ones of, of say fear or that somebody is um, not capable. We, we're training our 
brain to think differently. And the third is to amplify counter stereotypical images. And so when we're getting a ton of images from television and media, for example, uh, this is Peter Pan, then how to undo it by showing accurate information. So on the right, you have uh, my daughter, she's a fancy dress dancer, and you have Iron River Drum, a real group of drummers, and just specifically teaching, this is a stereotype, this is reality. Uh, most people don't know anything about Native Americans past the 1900s, and they see these kind of films when they are very young. It's not middle schoolers watching Peter Pan, it's usually preschoolers. But if you have no other examples, your entire academic career, which is the case for most Native American studies, that becomes the only image you have to associate. So even as a middle schooler or as a high schooler, these kind of stereotypical images are the ones that get pulled up because there hasn't been counter images and narratives and messages. So we're, I'm gonna um, do an example with you now of creating a new narrative. I'm gonna say three words. You don't have to say anything out loud. I just want you to get the image in your head and then we're gonna talk about it. So the first word that I'm gonna say is Winnebago. Get that image in your mind. Next one is Pontiac. And finally, Sequoia. Winnebago, Pontiac, and Sequoia. So when I said Winnebago, did you think of the people from the Great Lakes area? They're also known as the Ho-Chunk. This is an older picture of them and a more modern one. Or did you think of a huge recreational vehicle? When I said Pontiac, did you think of a car or did you think of this Ottawa leader who helped his own nation um, retain their sovereignty and fought for their cultural survival? And when I said Sequoia, did you think of the trees or did you think of this Cherokee man who did a wonderful thing in never having been literate, but seeing how writing worked, he created an alphabet syllabary, kind of like a phonics for the Cherokee uh, language. And in one generation, everybody in the nation was literate. And if you didn't think of those things, that's because they have been associated so long with something else. These are indigenous words. This is where the words originated. These are the people who it, they originated with. If you can't pull up anything to do with these original associations, it is also an example of cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is when that system, I talked about the system of racism, the system that has power. So the people who have power are able to take something, repackage it out of context and connect it with something brand new so that the original meaning of the word isn't even associated with the group anymore. And that's just one example of cultural appropriation. These words have been so appropriated, we often don't even connect them with the original people. So now you have the three other meanings for those words. Uh, now I want to shift to another kind of strategy, which is bringing in contributions. So when you talk about contributions, you're doing many things. You're, you're giving a bigger picture of our history and our connections to each other. You are showing appreciation for the cultures that created those things. And you're helping build pride in the people who have brought, who are connected to those contributions. So for Native Americans, uh, a lot of foods came from the Americas, corn, beans, squash, potatoes, tomatoes, tons of berries, tons of nuts, peppers. Um, these are all indigenous foods, but they weren't just discovered or found in the woods. Some of them were engineered. So corn was a grass that was engineered to be the big plant we now think of. Strawberries were found in the woods, but not all of these were. So it gives a chance to also look at the scientific engineering and the biology and all the other things that went into creating farming and propagating these different kinds of plants, as well as a relationship with the land. So some of the plants like 
knowing that willow bark helped a headache was by observing nature around us. So you observe animals that uh, like the bear that's looking like it's not feeling so good and it goes up to a tree and it starts eating some bark on the tree and then it walks away and it's better. And by observing the animals and respecting their space and you try it, you then find that, hey, willow bark really helps me when I have a headache. And so that relationship with the animals becomes an important way to um, give back to nature, to understand nature, to have a relationship with nature, and to acknowledge that we're a part of it as well. In addition to the contributions that Native Americans outright made to the world, there are also valuable resources under the land, the oil, the ore, the rubber, those kinds of things. And so it, is, it isn't, um, isn't fair to just think that those things were just found. The indigenous people cared for the land. And so by taking these things for the land, it is committing violence against the land. And a lot of that violence against the land is related to violence against the people. Because when you want the land, you might kill the food source so the people move, or you might divert the river so the people get moved, or whatever it is. And then these natural resources again, help the dominant culture, the system of advantage for the group that has power, they aren't necessarily helping the indigenous people. And in fact, if I go back to that first slide, the Navajo nation was definitely not helped by the uranium mining in that they now have no clean drinking water on their reserve. So outright contributions and the engineering to get them are important things to focus on, as well as what do children bring to our classroom. So this is a model that Tara Yasso uh, developed and then her graduate students added four more, which is the dark blue circles to this model. And it's an asset based model that I think we can all use. Not all, ki all kids come with a cultural wealth, but not all schools acknowledge these things as wealth. So I just wanna go over some of them um, which are here. And this is a new slide that are the wealth that our kids bring to the classroom that we don't always acknowledge. So aspirational wealth is the wealth that they bring in that they are already coming with resiliency. They want, they have their own hopes and dreams and aspirations. And we can, and they are, those aspirations are often shaped by family, siblings, uh, the community that they're living with, their grandparents. And so those folks can be role models and the kids want to do well in school. So really acknowledging that they come with that idea of wanting to do well. Linguistic wealth. The students who come with multiple language, they can, sometimes they can read, speak, share feelings in their own language, but not necessarily in the new language. So being bilingual is something that we want to keep, have them keep and nurture because in the future, being bilingual might be something that they really need for a job and can help them. It also is the way that they develop relationships with um, other people in their community and keep that connection. One of the first things that those Native American boarding schools did was say, you can't speak your own language anymore. And in some of the um, treaty agreements, which they specifically said, you can have this treaty, we can agree to this policy as long as you're speaking your own language. I'm thinking of the Mohawk language in particular. Um, and so it was general enough to say people had to speak Mohawk language and specific enough to say it had to be Mohawk. So what did the Mohawk do? They have a Mohawk language program for anyone. You don't have to be Mohawk because as long as the language is being spoken, that treaty needs to be upheld. And so there are reasons that we need to help kids retain their languages. And by the way, I'm still working on it. We all need to get used to saying uh, world languages because of course every language is a foreign language because none of us are speaking Wampanoag or Cherokee or any of the indigenous languages which are the languages of this land and every language is a foreign language so using world language is um, actually more encompassing. Um, familial wealth the relationships that we have with the people who care for us 
is one of our strengths. And we bring that to, kids bring that to the classroom. They have goals for their family. They've gotten validation, sage advice, um, role models, and the family is gonna provide critical support. And in many cultures that are matrilineal, the female head of household um, all, often has a particularly important role. In the um, indigenous cultures, we often think of um, women as they're raising warriors, uh, so men and women who will fight, as well as the caregivers, the men and women who will care for the family. So that role really bridges male and female in terms of who's doing the nurturing in the household. And there is information that kids bring from their families. Social wealth, kids already have peers and social con contacts that they're bringing into the classroom and they have networks. So maybe they have a network in a group outside of school that they can rely on for helping with a project or in a, a lesson or studying. So they're bringing in that, that social wealth from their outside communities that they're with. For me, that wealth comes from doing diverse activities. So sometimes I'm with the African-American community and sometimes I'm with the uh, Latina community. And so I'm bringing in information that I'm learning from those social groups as well. Um, and it could be what I'm learning is the books that we're reading. Maybe it's a book group. And by reading that book with that group of people, I'm learning things that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. And I have that to contribute to classes if the classes were arranged in a way that I could could share them. Navigational wealth is how resiliently kids can navigate through the systems. So some kids have had to navigate through um, what we call Indian country. So within the native community, they've had to navigate with the tribal groups. Some folks come from religious community or spiritual communities, and they've had to navigate how to be in those different adult or child-centered, if they are, venues. We might need to be, learn code switching. So when do we speak in slang? When do we speak in formal language? Um, how, how are they identifying? You know, if I'm with um, a mixed group of people and we're going to talk about race and we've been asked to sort ourselves, I might go to a multiracial group, but I might also go to a group that's people of color. And if we have a lot of people of color within that group, I might go to a group that's indigenous. And if that indigenous group has even more people in it, I might go to one that's specifically Southeast because that's where my indigenous group is from. So we can navigate a lot of different situations and we bring that ability with us to the classroom. Resistant wealth is our ability to dismantle stereotypes or notice stereotypes. And so I always like focusing a little bit on this one because sometimes we think how old do kids have to be before we have this conversation? Well, kids that have experienced the racism and the stereotypes are ready to have the conversation when they enter school. It's already been happening. They might not have the language, that's our job. That's where we can start talking about what it is that they've experienced. So this, sometimes the families are giving the information, but they don't have to if it's happening in school. The people who aren't really aware of them are usually from the dominant culture because they haven't experienced the stereotypes in the same way. So they haven't had the uh, discrimination or the microaggressions or the questions about their background or where they're from or why they speak English so well or those kinds of things or the exclusion of not being played with or whatever else is happening in, with younger kids. So this kind of wealth is that the kids already have had the experiences and are ready to dismantle those stereotypes and talk about what they are and, inter, in, and know what accurate information about their group is. Um, perseverant wealth, or she calls ganas, is the refusal to quit, how we've overcome obstacles. If you just look at African American history in itself, you can, um, you know that people who were enslaved figured out ways to learn to read, even with all of the laws saying you shouldn't 
read, it's illegal to read, they still taught themselves to read because there's a determination, a self-reliance, an inner confidence. Um, the ethnic consciousness wealth is feeling pride in your own culture and knowing um, that your culture has contributed something to the world. And then people come with spiritual faith-based wealth as well, a sense of purpose in life. And then the last one is pluriversal wealth, which is the, this wouldn't happen necessarily at lower grades, but we eventually hope to be able to move successfully in and out of multiple social spaces. So kids of color, kids from different ethnic groups come with that ability because they've already been doing it. I and mean, I've been doing it within the white community. I have to be able to go between the indigenous and the white community. And I have a lot of friends who are African-American, so I can do it in that community too. But if you're from the dominant culture, you're necessarily pushed to have to work between cultural and ethnic groups because you can actually go your whole life not really interacting because there are plenty of people that look like you who say are lawyers or work in banks or all these, or, institutions which you'd have to go to to do the things for life like buying cars and homes and those kinds of things so this wealth is something that kids of color do come to the classroom with the ability to already navigate different social situations of the world um, having talked about the gifts that people kids us kids bring to a classroom i want to go back for a minute to talk about um, some of the brain research and vocabulary research. Uh, vocabulary is a strong indicator of success. And this often happens with the background knowledge that kids have. But if we're not using the vocabulary from their background, then they aren't having an ability to actually talk about and use the knowledge that they do have. Um, and I highlighted at the bottom, that the amount of background knowledge students have relies a great deal on their cultural differences and their economic statuses. Economic, because if you don't have the funds to do more exploration, say um, travel or go to museums or you know even go to the movies, depending on um, what your situation is, you're gonna have less exposure to things that might come up in conversations. Um, vocabulary is something that needs to expand greatly and building that background knowledge and content is one of the jobs of special educators when we have kids to pull out the vocabulary that they do have and to introduce new vocabulary for topics that are going to be coming up in the classroom. So memory research is kind of interesting. I want to just point out for this that the research actually says that learning things linearly is not as good as learning it with pictures, like making connections, multi-sensory, um, and visualizing graphics that interconnect as opposed to just lists of things. And so one of the things that I tend to do with kids and memory is if I'm going to put out vocabulary, we put it on cards and then we might draw pictures with the cards, done some research with my team and it like 500% improves if they draw pictures. They don't even have to be pictures of the vocabulary word. They can be a symbol that helps remember the vocabulary word, but doing that visual graphic helps the vocabulary but then taking the words and sorting them and organizing them in different groups and chunking them together, manipulating them in real time also helps with the memory. Um, this neurologist, I'll read what it is here for folks that might have another screen open. Our brains are structured to remember novel events that are unexpected, chemicals and electrical signals pass from neuron to neuron across synapses in our brains in normal thought processing. And during an unexpected event, that extra dose of dopamine is released in our brain and it creates a stronger memory. So keep that in mind because during our instruction, we can add something that adds novelty. So we can have kids doodle. Um, we can put a roll of toilet paper on the table. We can, um, 
bring out, hold on a second. A giant dice, which I use today. Um, all those things bring in novelty and that helps kids actually learn having something interesting and new as well as whole body games like like charades when you do um movement things they can't be rote they have to kind of be creative and so charades gives you a chance to be more creative and we don't have time to do this activity and we didn't have breakout rooms available so I just wanted to tell you that one of the things I do with the big dice and vocabulary is you roll the dice and then each group has, picks up a vocabulary card, each person in a group, and then the kids need to do whatever the dice says. So they either give a non-example or a sentence or synonym, antonym, description, or they have to draw it. So a novel way to do vocabulary activities. Um, there, I do a lot of co-teaching in the real world, but my school is, we are full-time in person and have been since the beginning, but the kids never leave their classroom. The teachers come in through um, the Google Classroom or by screening them. So teachers come in and out, but only remotely. So it's like doing remote, but we're in school and there's one teacher for the group. So I don't get to do co-teaching in the same way that I did, but I'm still doing it in some ways. And I do have a remote class that I work with as well. So part of what I'm gonna be explaining here or reviewing here are models of co-teaching when we're back in the classroom. So these are four particular models. Just quickly, the duet model, both teachers are planning the instruction and take turns delivering the various components of the lesson. This is often considered the best model for student learning because both adults are seen as experts and kids will use both the adults and you can separate your rooms and that thing but that way the con of this is that it is the most time consuming and needs a lot of planning to figure out what you're going to do especially if you're the um the para or the special ed teacher or the related service provider and you don't know that content so one thing that makes this more effective is if you're assigned to the same subject or teacher year after year and you can start to develop an understanding of the content. The map and navigate, one teacher is the primary responsibilities and the other one shares in adapting, planning, delivery and assessment. It, it saves time and the second teacher is still teaching, but you can't address all the aspects of um, differentiated instruction that you'd want to address as you're doing that because you haven't done as much planning together. The adding model is the, it, you can think of it as speak and add. So one teacher primarily leaves the classroom and the other teacher adds with questions or with anecdotes or by um, telling other examples. And you don't necessarily need to have content knowledge to do this adding model. And this one is a good, good one for someone who's not in the classroom, a lot of related service provider perhaps that can still participate and be part of the room, but doesn't know the content. So they can ask questions or ask questions to help. Even if they know the answer, it helps other students in the room understand it or write words on the board if um, they're more complicated words or words that they know that someone in the class might not know, just write them down so you have a word bank. Um, anyone can do it. It doesn't require a lot of prep time. Um, sometimes you don't have as much chance to, if you're the second adult in the room, to add to the conversation. So that's one of the drawbacks. And the transforming model in this in co-teaching, both teachers share the design. They can address a variety of learning um, styles and other things that we want to focus on with differentiation, whether it's universal design or socio-emotional learning or English language learners, you can look at all those. It increases the engagement and the learning. You can specifically address IEP goals. Uh, students get what they need. Hopefully you're doing some kinesthetic stuff. Uh, the drawback again is that it is time consuming. So Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. 
And I want to focus on this for my last few minutes because having a relationship with students is one of the most important things we can do, not just because relationships are important and not just because um, relationships uh, help us feel like we know our kids and help the kids feel they know us. It's so that we can push kids. It's so that when we say, hey, you didn't do enough here, we have a relationship where we can do that kind of thing. That's what the relationships are about. So building our groups is one of those ways we build our relationships. So grouping is a part of co-teaching. So in each of those models, deciding on the type of groups that we're gonna do becomes an important part of that entire planning process. Small group instruction is how we have relationships with kids. It doubles the number of students when we have two groups because some kids are responding with one teacher, some kids are responding with the other. It allows for differentiation. And the research says that at least 65% of our class instruction should be in small group. The other thing it does is it, instead of walking around the room, when a teacher actually sits with a student, they're more likely to engage and it's more likely to start to continue to build that trusting relationships. Also, the research shows that group number should stay at three or four and that the fifth kid won't really engage. Just keep that in mind that we don't make the groups too big. In this virtual world, we've been just, uh, we use Google Meets at my school. They just um, uploaded the opportunity to do breakout rooms. And one thing to keep in mind is make them kind of small if you can, so we can get some maximum participation. Readiness groups are other types of models that students are uh, uh, grouped according to the readiness and giving their instruction at their level. There are benefits and drawbacks to doing homogeneous grouping. So this is something that you should keep in mind because it feels a lot like tracking if you don't change the groups often enough. And mixed readiness groups are just what it says and it gives a chance for the teachers to work with kids from different groups and not just one group all the time and you move them around and the kids get their role models. There's less stigma, nobody knows who's learning. If your topics are related to some of the topics that the kids of color are coming with their um, knowledge, then it gives them a chance to show what they know and highlight their own knowledge and their own skills that they're bringing to the classroom. And Zaretta Hammond is, has a book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. And she is really well known. I highly recommend the book these days for culturally responsive teaching and how it's related to the brain. And so if you grow up in a culture that uses songs to teach lessons, your brain is going to learn best when there's songs. If you grow up in a culture where you don't explain everything, you just kind of sit next to a person and try things out and they point out how to improve the thing they're doing, which happens a lot in indigenous culture as you're learning how to do certain crafts or skills like you know, gutting fish and drying it next to people, you just go and do it and then you get directed, then that's the way that your brain has developed to learn. So this is an example of how culture is actually related to the brain development and how kids come to school. And so what she says is that first you um, have to focus on interdependence. So this is different than the dominant view, which is everybody works individually and you can show that you can do it yourself. Grouping allows us to build that interdependence. Secondly, we need to build trusting relationships. That is from student to student, as well as student to teacher. And lastly, we need to build routines and processes in our, our school systems, not like gimmicks, but like regular routines, like regularly bring in that um, novelty item. It might not be a dice, but it might be something else. You bring in that novelty item. Um, regularly do songs or games or graphic organizers or sentence starters, you know, whatever it is, you're building that routine and it's a regular part of what you're doing. And so the final thing that I want to mention about Zaretta Hammond is if, you, if I were to capture her ideas in a nutshell, I'd say make it a game, make it a story, or make it social. 
games get the brain's attention, attention is needed to get any kind of understanding. It brings in the novelty, it helps students interact with each other, and a little competition is good. Make it a story. We already have um, algorithms in our brain for beginning, middle, and end for stories. And so when we tell stories, it helps us create a coherent narrative and stay in the brain. And social. The more that we do puzzles, repetition, finding patterns, making connections, that happens in, in a group, the more that we're doing culturally responsive teaching. And that is all. I'm ready for questions. Wow. Um, so we do have one specific question, but I want to read first, um, you know, one of the comments that was made um, out of all the talks today. This one is by far the most real. It's talking about something that must be talked about more openly to make real positive change. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, the chat here has been very active with things that have resonated with people. I know my district used that uh, Zaretta Hammond book um, and it just found it so great to have common knowledge, uh, common you know, vocabulary and thinking pattern when we're talking about how to best serve kids. So, so thank you so much. This was awesome. I'm gonna go to our uh, question that we have here and I'd encourage um, everybody to um, continue posting questions either in the Q&A or in the chat. We just have 10 minutes left, and I know that this session will end abruptly um, at 3.15, so I, I want to make sure that we don't get cut off here. So I know Sarah will be putting the survey in the chat box, so just a reminder that if you are aiming for CEUs, you do need to do that survey in any way. The, the data, of course, provides us great ways to improve. Um, and then also remember that this is the last session and that we hope to see everybody back in the closing speakers. Uh, session. So um, without further ado, the question is um, for somebody who would like to learn more about implicit bias or to broaden knowledge and understanding of other groups of people, what would you recommend for next steps? For example, books to read, websites to explore, conferences to attend. And then this person also says, thank you so much. You're amazing. I really appreciate your insight and education. So recommendations you would have for those of us who'd like to. So my first recommendation is, is it's, it's kind of a, it's not the answer you're looking for, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, there is no perfect resource. There's no perfect person. There's no perfect book. There's no perfect movie. All it is, is another perspective, example, information of what you're missing or what I'm missing. The more that I read, the more that I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And so for anything we want to learn something about, whether it's bias, Thanksgiving, um, the caste system, one book isn't going to give us enough information. We need to get as many various sources as we can. So listen to podcasts, read books, interact with people, go to events. All of those are going to help give us a better picture of what's going on. And I use the example with my um, students of uh, probability. If I were to flip a coin 10 times, I would expect 50% heads and 50% tails. That's what I'd expect. But I might get 80%, eight times it'll be heads and two times it'll be tails. But if I do it a thousand times, I'm going to get a lot closer to 50%. So what I'm saying is the more that we do it, the closer we get to the true story, the reality, the understanding of it. I and mean, having said that, there are um, a, lot of, a lot of books that I've read that I love. Uh, if you're looking at specific ethnic kind of books or about racial, book, racial segregation, a lot of the books in the top um, New York Times bestseller this entire summer up till now teach a lot about black racism, racism against black folks or understanding white privilege. So if you were looking for something about Native Americans, I would go with an indigenous people's history of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And um, I really like the book, My Grandmother's Hands 
about racism because it is different than all the other books in that he's a social worker and he gives a lot of strategies of things you can do. So you have to read it and sort of put it aside and try the strategies and then read it again and try the next thing. So it might be visualizations, it might be breathing, it might be actions. And I like that it has so many interactive things, but there's just tons and tons of, of um, stuff out there now, which is amazing. Cause like when I was in college, I didn't even see the, my nation's name in print until 1992. And that was only because it was the um, uh, 500 year anniversary of Christopher Columbus. And so all of a sudden they were looking for indigenous people to publish stuff. But prior to that, I hadn't even seen it in print. And so, you know, there, while you're looking at the books, I, mean, I have a book group and I almost always try to interrupt my implicit bias by looking for female authors and authors of color because the ones that you hear about and the ones that are out there are often mainstream, often white and men. So just interrupting it right away and saying, if I have a choice between books, is this one by uh, author of color and a female, for example. I can't hear Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you so much. I've, I've popped some of those titles into the chat box. Um, and then we also have another participant here who came on a bit late and was wondering um, if if you could go back and do the, um, well, the it, you explained your name. I think the question is, is Fox Tree your, uh, your family name, your heritage name? And, and so. So Fox Tree is my like father's that. name. It's my, my father's name that he received in a naming ceremony. And so that's the name he uses. Um, my five children all have indigenous names. Uh, Two Feathers, Smiling Heart, Drum, Rolling Thunder. They'd kill me if I couldn't, because I can't come up with sort of a Kissing Raccoon and Loving Bear. Now they may grow up and decide they want to use that as their last name. Like they might use Two Feathers as their last name, for example. And you know, it's not so strange to change names. Many women have been doing it for centuries and many people have done it when they've immigrated and changed their names. So changing names, I mean, look at Malcolm X. I mean, he changed it for a particular reason. And so indigenous people do change their names. And I, I would hope that, you know, if I survived a bear attack that I could get a new name too. But right now, <laughs> Um, I had my naming ceremony more recently and the people who did it knew me. And so that's why I got the name Takina Ru, her woman who leads or woman who teaches. But Fox Tree is my father's name. And I like to wow. say two words like sitting bull and crazy horse. <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you for sharing the history of your family and your children and the naming ceremony, I imagine that's something that's very um, significant. Um, a few other comments, just um, it's so important for us all to know the history of eugenics, the history of cultural and racial bias and testing. So thank you again for sharing. I know that was a new, a, something new for me. So that's definitely a new learning I'm taking away. Um, well, I'm really glad because yeah. at the last minute, I'm like, should I take that out? I mean, these are all special educators. They know this history of testing. So I'm glad I kept it. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a, you know, really diverse audience. So I don't know that everybody is, a, you know, specifically, um, you know, experienced in, in special education. So I thought this was just fantastic. Um, everyone, lots of action here in the chat box. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. This is just what we need. Um, really fantastic content. I'm, I'm just kind of uh, saving a couple minutes here in case there are any more final questions. We do have four minutes until we're cut off abruptly. <laughs> um, and I know that happened at one of the earlier presentations today. So I just want to make sure that doesn't happen to us because we want to have the opportunity to thank Claudia Fox. I will say one other thing, um, mcnaa.org, Massachusetts Center for Native American Awareness, .org, mcnaa.org, has a 21-day um, challenge for understanding racism against Indigenous people. So it's different things you can do every day. 21-day challenge. I well, it's love like a list that. of things. Five things, pick something. Five things, pick something. <laughs> 
And so you could do it with your family and learn about indigenous people. So I curated that with um, Debbie Irving. You might know her, she wrote um, Waking Up White and Eddie Moore, who wrote a book about um, white women teaching black boys or black kids. I can't remember the name of the book, it has lots of different um, articles in it. So we three put that together and uh, it's a good starting point for indigenous education, which is important Thank for you. everyone because this is the land we're on. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. I see lots of other uh, options here in the chat box. And I know Sarah did pop, put that website. I love the idea of a 21 day challenge. I think it's great for this kind of home learning, remote learning, hybrid learning. Kids need sometimes things to just be stirred up a little bit and to have a challenge um, in the form of a bingo card or of a daily kind of exercise. Um, just any more questions here? Otherwise, we'd, we'd uh, like to thank Claudia Foxtree for joining us. It is our honor and privilege here at the RTSC conference to have had you as a guest. Um, I feel like we've learned so much and we are so incredibly grateful. And I'll just remind everyone to do the survey to get your CEUs, just also to provide us some data, give um, Claudia Foxtree some feedback. And um, remember this is the last session, so we'll see everybody back at the speakers. Claudia Foxtree, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.